weighty subjectivity, the dominated groups are marked with an essence, imprisoned in a given set of possibilities. Group differences as otherness thus usually generates dichotomies of mind and body, reason, emotion, civilized and primitive, developed and underdeveloped, close quote. Apart from this conscious prospect, uh, process of othering, the category of indigenous peoples based on ethno-linguistic affiliation misses on the other nuances of individual and group identity. First, the categories, as well as the statistics now, are class and gender blind. Many households of indigenous peoples are still very dependent on agriculture. The NCIP ethno-linguistic listing does not reveal the exact relationship of indigenous people's households to agricultural production or use or development of natural resources. NCIP cannot validate the claim that in northern, Min that in northern Mindanao, indigenous groups are becoming farm workers more rather than owner cultivators or the causes of this phenomenon. They do not differentiate between the farmer gardeners among the Kankanai and the tenant farmers of Ifugao, peoples in their rice terraces. They also have no capability to validate the claim that while some indigenous peoples have diversified their marketable crops, many have retained traditional methods of staple crops. Categorizing indigenous peoples based on ethno-linguistic affiliation also fails to capture the difference among groups which have had a greater possibility for upward mobility and those that are still especially economically vulnerable. For instance, indigenous communities in the northern Cordillera have greater possibilities compared with groups in Palawan, uh, Palawan and Mindoro. This is, that, thus, it is more likely that there would be a lawyer from most of the groups in the Cordillera than from the Batak of the Palawan or from the Mangyan groups in Mindoro. Neither is the government sensitive to making distinctions among indigenous groups or among communities within ethno-linguistic groups, insofar as their dependence on natural resources are concerned. Like, for instance, forest dependent versus non-forest dependent, small-scale miners, those dependent on tourism, and others. More importantly, statistics for indigenous people's groups do not identify the number of women within the population and fail to distinguish roles that they have taken within the communities in general. Second, some of the categories which are based on language fail to make distinctions within groups. The Subanen is considered as one ethno-linguistic group. However, the reality is that this classification is composed of a number of communities speaking different dialects and occupying territory in northwestern Mindanao, which stretches from the Sambuanga Peninsula to Misamis Oriental. They share in many customary political structures, such as the multi-level Timuai, or village leader, but differ in details regarding their customary law. The Kalinga peoples are grouped into Ili, villages, some of which are Binodnan areas, or areas that still use the Bodong or the Pispak, negotiated through their Pangat or their Pispak holder. A minority of the villages, however, do not have this institution, either because it has not been used or had not been present customarily. Significantly, categorizing based on ethno-linguistic affiliation fails to capture the discussion and debate within communities regarding even the use of customary law, the relationship to outside, outsider culture, the role of local government institutions vis-a-vis -vis their own customary political units. The culture of almost all indigenous communities in the Philippines are open to interaction with others. In fact, it is possible to identify many customary norms in some of them which pertain to rules governing treatment of aliens. Their various histories also show a great deal of trade and other forms of contact with other indigenous groups, even those coming outside the Philippines. As a result, cultures have been dynamic. They have evolved in various ways as a result of interaction with outsiders and changes in the economic, political, and social system outside their communities. Third, the unreasonable distinction between Muslim indigenous peoples and non-Muslim indigenous peoples persists. Many members of communities within specific ethno-linguistic affiliations have embraced Islam as a religion. Identification dominantly based on the political agenda of Muslim collectives 
is largely due to a common history of discrimination and oppression because they were a minority religion, quote unquote. Traditionally, however, government agencies dealt with Muslim groups as Muslim groups with no reference to ethnicity or indigenity. The intersection of religion and indigenity, therefore, is not satisfactorily handled in the law nor in its implementation. Finally, even the concept of indigenous peoples in relation to their ancestral territories is not stable. Current literature challenges the notion that it's possible to generalize tenurial arrangement even for a specific culture. There is growing recognition that indigenous tenure systems change through time. Also, the notion that individual ownership of certain portions of ancestral territory only came through colonialism in some communities are now being challenged. The Banuaons of Balit, San Luis, Agusan del Sur, the study area of Professor Gatmaitan, understand that while their entire territory belongs to their community, they consider their internal boundaries as fluid and subject to negotiation with others, even to the extent of including outsiders who have acquired legitimate claims through hard work. Within their territories, individual claims may prevail. And here I would quote Professor Gatmaitan. In 1979, Schlegel wrote about Tirurais in Figel, a village in Mindanao. He observed that the rights to possession by this indigenous community were conditioned on their ability to make the land productive. Failure to do so would allow the area devoted to agriculture to be reoccupied by other individuals within their village. Within their Sweden farms, therefore, they were more concerned with making the lands productive rather than establishing individual, that is private, ownership over the land. However, in 1981, the same author saw that the introduction of the plow created the condition to induce individual ownership of the land rather than simply exclusive rights to use property. Permanent fields require more investment and energy, thus fostering a more permanent relationship to the land. Kainin, or Sweden farming, is generally a method of cultivation that uses fire cutting tools and sticks. After clearing a patch through fire and cutting within the forest, the farmer punches holes on the ground and buries seeds. The method relies heavily on rain and is fertilized by the ashes of the forest and the remains of the plants and the harvest of the last cultivation. Although productive, it does not last long. The area is then left to follow for periods from 10 to 20 years, within which the soil and the forest regenerate. A new cycle of cultivation and follow may, follow, may follow on the original patch. The ecological viability of Sweden agriculture among indigenous peoples has amply been demonstrated. However, these studies were undertaken of communities where population densities were lower, forests still abundant, and the migrant intrusion sparse and controlled. It is therefore difficult to make sweeping conclusions as, as to whether this type of cultivation causes forest denudation or assists in regeneration. Definitely, the shift in cultivation technology adds pressure in a community rethinking of tenure, tenure rights. The, Kalaman, the Kalam, Kalamian Tagbanwa of Koron filed the first formal ancestral domain claim over ancestral waters, or their Tiib Ang Surublien. The tenurial system of the Kalamian Tagbanwa are different from the Tagbanwa of mainland Palawan, distinct from the many land-based indigenous groups. Dependence for traditional livelihood over marine resources also exists among the Bajaus of Basilan and Sulu, the Molbog of Balabak, Palawan, the Agta of northeastern Luzon, and the Ati of Boracay. Yes, there are Atis in Boracay. It is not possible on a national scale, therefore, to generalize the content of tenurial arrangement corresponding to unique communi communities of specific communities within ethno-linguistic groups. It is only within specific communities that it is possible to understand their existing tenurial systems and also the process through which these systems change. Elaborating rights in the legal arena is referred to by Professor Duncan Kennedy as legalism. He notes that legalism not only embeds politics, but also translates wide-ranging political and cultural questions into narrowly framed legal questions. To him, 
legal questions bear a certain hostility to discursive, open-ended, multi-genre, and polyvocal conversations about how we should live, what we should value, what we should prohibit, and what is possible in our collective life. These discursive contestations are replaced with adversarial yes-no structures, which can quash exploration, expert and specialized languages, which can preclude democratic participation, a pretense that the ontological grounds can and must always be found. This masks the historical embeddedness of many political questions and the covertness of norms and political power within legal spaces repeatedly divests political questions of their most crucial concerns. When the available range of legal remedies preempts exploration of the deep constitutive causes of an injury, when the question of which rights pertain overrides attention to what occasions the urgently felt need of the right, we sacrifice our chance to be deliberative, inventive political beings who create our collective life form. Legalism that draws its parameters of justice from liberalism imposes its own standards of fairness when we might need a public argument about what constitutes fairness. Its formulas for equality when we may need to reconsider all the powers that must be negotiated in the making of an egalitarian order. Its definitions of liberty at the price of an exploratory argument about the constituent elements of freedom." Close quote. But this discourse of legalism may be too sweeping. Legal norms do act as legal placeholders, but they may also provide platforms for better formulation. Progressive norms, even essentialized identities, one in legal texts, can be seen as starting incremental changes. They may simply be tentative arrangements until the more effective recourse is found to address urgent or imminent threats. New interpretations may reformulate old legal labels and therefore neutralize the effectiveness of the usual stereotypes against progressive projects. We should critically examine what conditions in law as well as its, in its process and institutions can bring this about. We cannot simply describe law's failures. It is clear now that procedural and substantive provisions of the IPRA do not need the needs of marginalized sectors of indigenous communities. Originally intended to recognize ownership of ancestral domains in 1988, politicians took advantage of its presence to provide for a virtual Magna Carta for indigenous peoples. It became too broad. Concrete mechanisms for its implementation were not adequately spelled out, except for the process of gaining paper recognition of ancestral lands and domains. Thus, while some social, economic, and cultural rights are mentioned broadly, no provisions for both budget and program are mentioned in the law. The result is an NCIP which focuses more on the struggle to get official recognition of title to ancestral domains. In spite of the seriousness of health, economic, and educational issues for the everyday life of indigenous communities, the NCIP has not yet focused evolving its capabilities in understanding these problems and evolving programs for specific communities. The implicit theory of both the law as well as the indigenous people's movement seems to have been that as long as the rights to ancestral domain are officially recognized by government, the rest, political and economic empowerment, will follow or can be catalyzed. Current developments put these assumptions into question. The structures created by the IPRA have also failed to resist political pressures and therefore are not up to the challenge of asserting nuanced governance and tenurial systems against well-entrenched dominant interests. Advocates for indigenous peoples are all too familiar with the task force on ancestral domain created by the office of the president during the administration of President Estrada that weakened the entire NCIP. They too are familiar with the woeful budget allocated to it. The recent, then recently, the transfer of the entire agency from the Office of the President, then to the Department of Agrarian Reform, then to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, and finally back to the Office of the Presid President, 